So this is a method of Midrash. We're doing Agadot. We've been doing Agadot for the past uh, couple weeks. And I wanted to get into, I don't remember what the reason was that brought us to this topic. Moshe said that we might have actually uh, touched on this subject some point in the past week. And sometimes a latent suggestion in my mind ends up uh, directing me without conscious awareness to the, to the topic of the next uh, session, which is fine. It's all Torah, it doesn't matter. So um, this is a, about a famous, uh, a famous a heretic, we could call him, uh, a person uh, who was actually a great, great Tabir Chacham. So it's someone that we have to speak about when we speak about uh, Elisha ben Avuya, who's called Acher in the Talmud, he's called the other guy, when we speak about him, we have to speak about him with a measure of, obviously, reverence and kavod for uh, his learning and his greatness as a person, as we're going to see. That's part of what the tension is and part of what the issue is in the uh, in these agadot. And at the same time, we have to look at him with uh, a measure of criticism, because obviously he, uh, he went wrong somewhere. Uh, that's, that's, the, that's the assumption, that's the presumption of the, uh, of the Talmud. Now... Um, I put all the English sources here. It's, this is, these sources appear primarily in uh, three different places. I mean, the primary place to learn about Elisha ben Avuya is in Masechet uh, Chagiga, actually, in the second chapter. That's where the main place in the Talmud Bavli. It's mentioned here and there, Masechet Kiddushin. It's mentioned in some of the Midrashim. It's also talked about in the Yerushalmi. Some of the stories come from the Yerushalmi. Um, in either case, and this doesn't, and even though these sheets are even longer than usual, they don't even include all of the different isolated statements about Elisha ben Avuya. I didn't bring all of them because if you if you traverse, you know, many midrashim, you'll find a statement here, a statement there pertaining to him. And what I'd like to do, what I'd like to try to do. Um, is just with, with the preface, with the with the disclaimer that you know we can't fully understand somebody of the stature of Elisha ben Avuya. We shouldn't assume that he is you know uh, someone who operates on the same level that we do, or that people who leave Judaism that we know operate. So we we have to give him more credit than that. At the same time. Uh, you know, we have to understand what the, the Talmud records the stories about Elisha ben Avuya in order to teach us something. Now, just to give you an idea of who Elisha ben Avuya was, first of all, he appears in Pirkei Avot. Everybody recognizes the name, really, from Pirkei Avot. But he's also was the teacher of Rabbi Meir. Okay? Or one of the teachers of Rabbi Meir, uh, together with Rabbi Akiva. So we're not talking about someone of you know, just even one of the regular Tanaim. We're talking about somebody who would have been the major league, uh, a major league, Talmir Chacham, one of the greatest in his generation. And so I opened, you know, I had, a, I had to choose, this was, a, uh, this was my uh, discretion, to choose what I was going to put on the top of the page. And so I chose what I think is probably the, uh, the open, opening to the story, the introduction to the story, and also, in a way, the, uh, the most famous uh, uh, story or aspect of the story, which is, four entered the Pardes. This is from Masechet Chagiga. So, four entered the Pardes. What does the Pardes refer to? The orchard. What kind of orchard is it? It's talking about, this is in Masechet Chagiga, which is discussing esoteric understandings of Hashem, or what we would call Mase Merkava going into the work of the chariot or the very advanced metaphysical speculations whether you are a mikubal or you're not a mikubal these are the metaphysical speculations the area of Torah that is the most hidden and uh, secret aspect of the Torah and um, of course the Rambam talks about how uh, even the Gidolei Yisrael we're talking about the Rambam who's not a mikubal says that even the Gidolei Yisrael most of them couldn't reach Masem Erkavat something beyond the reach of most people even the great Chachamim and we shouldn't feel bad about it. So that's yeah. So when when I'm sorry, this is described very weirdly, right? Right. So, so this is the vision of God. So this is the vision. So really, what there are two there are two topics that are reserved for the elite in Masechet Chagiga. One is called Maseh Bereshit, and one is called Maseh Merkava. Now the Rambam essentially, and, and truthfully, so the Arizal and the Rambam essentially agree on what these two sciences are, okay, which is interesting. Like two right? Together. Right. Maseh Bereshit, you can teach, you can tutor somebody. So one person. Yeah. You can tutor somebody in Maseh Bereshit. You can't tutor them in Maseh Merkava. You can only give them what's called Rashi Prakim. You can give them a hint, and they have to figure it out themselves. It's not something that can be articulated. So, uh, 
so the um, so Maseh Bereshit is what we would call you know natural science or understanding the universe, the secrets of how the universe works, the secrets of creation, something of that nature. Whereas Maseh Merkava is addressing more what we would call in our fancy uh, academic language metaphysics. In other words, the spiritual realms, uh, the Malachim, the angels, the names of God and what they represent. How do we understand how Hashem, a purely spiritual metaphysical entity, existence, you know, interacts with the physical world? How do, how do we comprehend that? How do we wrap our heads around that? So that's, those kinds of questions are dealt with in Maseh Merkava. They're dealt with in Kabbalah, in a Kabbalistic way, and they're dealt with in the non-Kabbalistic treatments of Maseh Merkava by the Rambam and the Radak and, and the Chachamim, who were not of the Kabbalistic school, in a different way. But essentially, they're dealing with the same issues. So if you read Masechet Chagiga, or you read the Midrashim on Maseh Bereshit and Maseh Merkava, respectively, in other words, those are the Tanakh texts that are sent. If you want to if you, the reason why the rabbis call it Masem Bereshit and Masem Merkava is because to them, there always has to be a focus in a Tanakh text. So what's a Tanakh text for understanding the cre- secrets of creation? It's Bereshit, the beginning of Bereshit, which they said up to the creation of Adam and through the creation of Adam is the secret part. That's Masem Bereshit. It talks about in Masem Merkava exactly up to what pasuk is considered Masem Bereshit. Masem Merkava talks about also up to what part of the vision of Yechezkel is considered Masem Merkava. But that's just the text that it's based on. If you look at all of Kabbalah, all of Kabbalah is basically based on that vision. All the terminology, all of the all of the ideas are rooted in the vision of um, uh, of Maseh Merkava. If you look at the uh, if you look at uh, philosophy of the Rambam and the metaphysics of the Chachamim, who are not Mikubalim, it's the same thing. It's rooted in the same Nivua. But it, obviously. Each word in that nivuah has, uh, you know, such profound depth that we, you know, it's beyond our uh, ability to imagine. So it's, we look at it as a simplistic kind of a reading. There's one opinion in the Gemara that says that we shouldn't even read Yecheskel. We shouldn't even read Masem Merkava. Of course, we read it as the Haftarah for Shavuot, right? But uh, but we, you know, there's one opinion that says you should never read it because then people are going to start saying, "What does this mean?" and try to figure out what it is, and it's going to lead them to trouble. So in any case, when it talks about Pardes, the Rambam says that these things, when it, whenever the Gemara talks about Pardes, it means going into these esoteric subjects. Now, four outcomes occurred. There were four people who went in. The four people were Rabbi Akiva, wh- whom we know was a very upstanding person. Uh, the other person who went in was Ben Zoma, who is also very well known, especially for being mentioned in the Haggadah, which not everybody has the... Uh, uh, you know, that level of fame that even, you know, reformed Jews know who he is because he's in the Haggadah, you know. They know where Akiva is, they know where Ben Zoma is. Then there's Ben Azai, who's famous. Does anybody know why Ben Azai is famous? By any chance? From Masachet Kiddushin? Did you ever learn Masachet Kiddushin? A little bit? Why is Ben Azai famous? Of course he's famous, but there's one thing he's famous for. Do you know what it is? That he never got married. Shechashkan nafsho Torah. Says he loved the Torah so much he could never bring himself to get married. So that's so that's Ben Azai was famous for that. So Ben Zoma was famous because he's in the Haggadah. Ben Rebbe Akiva is famous because he's famous. Ben Azai is famous because he never married. He's the he's the one example that the Gemara gives us of a of a Tamil Chacham who's Hashkan of Shabbat Torah so much that uh, he couldn't get married. He couldn't. His energies were so involved in Torah. And then you have, uh, and then you have Acher, who's Elisha Ben Avuya. Um, he, he calls Acher. So let's see what was the outcome for each of these folks. So one peaked. It says Hetzitz. Okay, Vamet, and he died. Okay. He, in other words, he had some breakthrough into this Masem Merkava that was so overwhelming. He died. It's hard to imagine how that would happen, but somehow he couldn't handle it. He couldn't go on. One Hetzitz Venifga is the word. He looked in and he was harmed. What does it mean harmed? It means he went crazy. And in fact, the Gemara talks about how... We'll, we'll see who it was in a second. It was, that was Ben Zoma, actually. One peaked and cut the shoots. Katsatz benetiot. What does it mean to cut the shoots? It means to become a heretic, to uproot Judaism. Okay? And that is going to be Elisha ben Avuya. And then, and then lastly, one echad nechnas b'shalom v'yatsa b'shalom. One went in in peace and left in peace. And that's Rabbi Akiva. So you have four outcomes. Uh, dying is obviously a bad outcome. Going crazy is a bad outcome too, although he's still alive. Becoming a heretic is a bad outcome. The only person who had a uniformly good outcome was Rabbi Akiva. So why do it if your chances are 25? Ah. Wait, uh, that's a good question. <laughs> the word it uses for Rabbi Akiva is not peak, is it? Huh? He puts a Hebrew word he uses. Nichnas b'shalom v'yata b'shalom. So it doesn't say peak mm-hmm. inside, but it could be. Right, it doesn't say it's, it's. Right, so that's a very good point. 
And I think that that I'm glad that you mentioned it because you know it, 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 I didn't reflect upon that point, but you're right. I mean, hetzitz implies that they caught a glimpse of something beyond what they were supposed to see, right? Because hetzitz has the implication like metzitz mina harakim. He gl- he looks through the lattice, right? A person who glances somewhere that's really supposed to be private, and he catches a glimpse of something he's not supposed to, right? So you're absolutely right. So hetzitz implies that they looked somehow beyond what was supposed to be accessible to them. They literally looked? Or oh, no, no. It's referring to intellectual looking. It's intellectual looking. It's a metaphor. So it's, it's not literal that they went to some kind of orchard and they had uh, apple picking day, you know? Right. They're talking about they got into some deep metaphysical uh, speculation and Hetzitz, you're right. It has the implication that they looked, they, they snuck in, you know, to something that they weren't supposed to be peeking into. And so, the, you know, if you read Masechet Chagiga, which I encourage you to do, but taking it, you know, to the level that you can understand it, which is going to be, you know, all of for all of us, you know, only uh, on a surface level, but we can read it and see that apparently, you know, Rabbi Akiva tries to give them certain guidance in terms of not making certain mistakes when they go into the, when they delve into it, and they uh, maybe or maybe not you know, take his, his, his advice. So the point is that there could be some Rashi Prakim, like we said, that the person who understands the area can give some guideposts to a person who's seeking an understanding of the area. But it's uh, but you can't explain it to another person. And I think the reason you can't explain it is because it has to be. It's something that our language is really insufficient to express. I don't think it's purely a matter of... Uh, it's not purely a matter of it's Asur to tell him. Is it because I, well, I think that it's it's not that it's you know part of it is you're not supposed to, but I think the reason you're not supposed to is because language is laden with all kinds of meaning. Meaning, it's very it's very limiting, and so when you say a word, right, and somebody interprets that word in their own framework, they're not really getting what you're trying to tell them. In a, at a certain level of you know at a certain advanced level, what Rabbi Akiva might be saying to you about Masa Merkava, you're going to filter it through your understanding, and you're not going to understand what he's saying. Is that like so a slang or something? It's not. A, it might be. You could think of it as a, a technical language. Okay, like uh, if somebody says, "Where's the mouse?" They don't mean that there's a mouse running around on the floor. They mean that there's a mouse for the computer, right? So that's a silly example because it wouldn't be that obvious, but. You know, at a certain level, we use metaphors to describe things about metaphysics all the time. Everything we talk about God is a metaphor. Like, in fact, the Rambam uses a language in the beginning of Sefer Ramadan where he says, all the descriptions, uh, descriptions of Hashem, of course, are mashal. And then he says, vehakol mashal. Everything is really a mashal. And it's really a powerful language because it's very true. Everything that we speak about that isn't physical, like, think about how we talk about ideas. We say, I'm... Uh, I'm abs- a person absorbs certain ideas or grasps an idea. You don't really grasp an idea, right? You don't. Grasping is with your hands. But we use all kinds of metaphors because it's very difficult. We talk about a flow of ideas. You know, we t- we have all kinds of metaphors that we use when we're trying to describe things that are not tangible. And so the um, the uh, you know the same is true with this, especially Kal because it's in in this very esoteric realm. And so. Each of these chachamim tried to go into uh, understanding the, uh, these areas, and the ones who peaked beyond what they were ready for had bad outcomes. One, physically couldn't handle whatever they discovered. So what you see from this is that there's something overwhelming about this knowledge, that someone can stretch themselves beyond their ability and either be not ready for the truth, not ready for certain things, that they're going to die from it, or they're, it's gonna, they're going to go crazy, which somehow means that they're going to it's going to it's going to distort. Like the Rambam uses the example, a nice example in Morin Abuchim, that if a person strains their eyes to see things that are very close, after a while they can't see what's you know I'm sorry that are very far away. If you strain your eyes to see, you know let's say you're supposed to be wearing glasses and instead you don't wear your glasses, right, like what I tried to do when I was in high school, I don't want to wear my glasses. I forgot them all the time. So, um, you know, in, 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 if you do that, it can actually damage your eyes. You strain your eyes, and then you won't even be able to see what's close to you. So he says in the same way, if somebody tries to stretch themselves beyond what they're ready to understand, it can then distort even what's close to them, even what, even what they could understand before. And that, that, he dis- that, he says, is really what happened to Ben Zoma. In other words, he went crazy, meaning that his whole, he messed up his mind because he tried to stretch himself beyond what he was able to, and he just ended up 
lost, intellectually lost somehow. And then, of course, we had Akher. Akher is Elisha ben Avuya. And we need to understand what happened to him. Okay? We want to understand. How could such a great Talmud Chacham of the top caliber, I mean top, top shelf Talmud Chacham, how does he end up becoming a heretic of the top shelf? <laughs> You know, how does that happen? And so the Gemara goes to great lengths in several Agadot to explain it. And what I want to try to get to from this entire discussion is what do we, what are the Chachamim really trying to say? Are are all these different explanations, you know, some people read these explanations and they say, the rabbis are grasping at straws to try to figure out what went on here because I have 16 different explanations of what happened. I don't think that that's true. I think that if you look beneath the surface, we will see that all of these explanations are in a metaphoric way, in an agadic way, in a midrashic way, pointing to the same kind of error or the same kind of problem that held Acher back from being able to progress into this area of knowledge without being damaged. Now what we learn from it is that apparently there are certain truths that are really difficult to accept or really difficult to understand, not only very difficult to understand and comprehend, but really difficult to accept really difficult to integrate or uh, to assimilate into our other understanding of the world. Like, look what happened to Eov, for example. He, he's, can, you know, he ends up confronted with certain truths about how Hashem runs the world that are not exactly the comfortable way that people like to think about how Hashem runs the world. And that can be debilitating to someone. Or it could lead someone like Eov to say, there is no, uh, there is no divine plan, obviously. That's where, that's where Eov goes. So we see that certain truths can be very, very painful. Look at what happened when the people disco- religious people discovered that the earth revolves around the sun instead of the sun revol- revolving around the earth. Now we say, okay, well now we're, we, we're very comfortable with that idea, but there was a time where that was an extremely painful idea for people to not think that the world, literally, that the universe revolved around that. You know, so to us we say, well, you know, we never had that thought because we all grew up assuming the opposite, but... You know, to, to people who thought, to, for whom it was theologically very important to believe that they were at the center of God's attention, so to speak, and find out that no, actually, the center of the universe is somewhere else, and we are like on the periphery hanging out here, you know, very far from the center. It's like, hey, wait a second, how could that be? You know, how could it be that we're on the periphery? We're on some rock floating, you know, how, I have no idea how many light years from the center. So, uh, in any case, what happened to Akher? Let's take a look. He cut down the shoots. What does it mean that he cut down the shoots? Amongst them, who was the greatest? Before Rabbi Akiva. I mean, Akiva. They were, these were all the four greatest Chachamim that lived at this time. Okay? They're, they're not like, you know, these are not like, nobody here is someone where you say, oh, well, of course he went off the derech because, you know, he was. They're all alive at the same time, right? The same generation. Why did Ben Zoman, Ben well, back then, you know, not everybody was called by a title like Rav or Rebbe or anything like that. I mean, uh, maybe uh, Ben Azai and Ben Zoma, I don't know why, actually, why they don't. Elisha Ben Avuya, even in Pirkei Avod, he calls, he's called Elisha Ben Avuya. I'm not sure. I mean, he was the, he was the teacher of, of Rebbe Meir. He obviously must have been someone. Maybe they took his title away afterwards. I don't know. Benzaman, Benza, you know, some of them they don't call Rav. Like Shmuel is never called Rav. Hillel is never called Rav. So some of them are so great that it's actually, uh, it's actually the opposite. You know? Yeah, like if somebody says great. Madonna, everybody knows who I'm talking about. Right? There's certain people that they're so famous, you don't need to say Rav, Rebbe, Mr., Mrs. Everybody knows it. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's like, could be. It's disrespectful. You have it's almost. It's like you're disrespecting, you know, like as Arzama, you say Mr. and Mrs. or so what? Yeah. I'm like, oh, Frank, you come over here. And it's, well, I don't think that, I don't think their te- obviously their students wouldn't call them by their first name, but they're not. Uh, they didn't necessarily have to have a title. Like Shmuel is the best example. He's just called Third Shmuel. First Hillel. Title. Right. If you talk directly to him, you're not gonna say, Hey, Shmuli, come over here. You know, yeah. They're not gonna talk to him like that. Okay. Now. Acher, what happened to him? So let's look at... This is the most bizarre of the, of the explanations of what, ha, of what he saw. Hitzitz. What he saw that caused him to cut the shoots. This is the bizarre one. Okay? Acher Adisha Ben Abuya. Now, this is all cut and pasted, so please forgive bad translations. I did not translate this myself. I corrected because there are actually factual mistakes in some of them about the story, but I didn't catch all of them. It's likely that there are other ones that I, did, that I overlooked. So what did he do? So it says, do not... Okay. What is this about? That's... Uh, Al-Titanet Picha... Uh, 
So that's, it says, don't, don't let your mouth make your flesh sin. In other words, you know, don't talk too much. Don't, uh, don't think too much beyond what you're able to because it's going to cause you to do a chet. So what is this about? He saw that Metatron happened to be granted authority to sit to record the mer- merits of Israel. This is some angel up in heaven. He sees him sitting down. What did he see in his vi- whatever vision he had? He saw this angel sitting down, writing down the merits of the Jewish people. And he said, it is a tradition that on high there is no sitting, no strife, no division, and no toil. So perhaps there are two supreme powers. Because I know that in Hashem's realm, there's no sitting down. And Yeshiva, it says, there's no sitting down. So, therefore he said, they said to uh, heaven, so, so he concluded that there must be two supreme, supreme powers. Then they brought him to Metatron and they smote him with 60 bands of fire. They said to Metatron, when you saw him, why did you not stand up before him? In other words, they said to Metatron, why didn't you stand up so that he wouldn't think that they were sitting, they wouldn't be confused. Then authority was granted to Metatron to erase the merits of the apostates. The heavenly voice went forth and said, return you turncoat sons, except for this apostate. Okay, so what is going on here? This is bizarre, beyond bizarre, but um, you know, it's, he sees some angels sitting down. He, uh, you know, somehow he uh, uh, says as a result of seeing him sitting down that uh, there must be two forces in the universe, God and something else, because... Uh, you know, because he sees this uh, this angel sitting down recording things. It's very strange, and uh, and then they punish him. The phys- he doesn't even say that. He just says the fact that he's sitting down. So we have to understand this is all talking about some kind of metaphysical vision. So what does it mean sitting down, standing up, writing, hitting with uh, pulsa denura? What it, you know? What is this all talking about in this metaphysical vision is going on here? Okay, the next story is, tells us where he got his name Acher. So he met a woman that he wanted to go with, and it was a non-Jewish woman. She said to him, Aren't you Elisha ben, aren't you Elisha ben Avuya, the great rabbi? Why are you asking me out? What, are you crazy? This isn't Borough Park, where you see a lot of Hasidim with peyotes doing all kinds of things, you know, unfortunately. Ba'avon otenu harabim, you know? Now they don't ask the question. But back then... And anyway, this was a famous rabbi. So, uh, what did he, so he went on Shabbat and he picked a radish out of the ground and gave it to her and said, Look. she said, oh, acherhu. He must be somebody else. He can't be the rabbi because the rabbi would never pull a radish out of the ground on Shabbat. So that's how he became called acher, somebody else. Then he, that can't be the person that we all know as Elisha ben Abuya. That was kind of a defining moment for him, right? Where he had to decide, who am I? Who am I going to be? My first identity that I'm recognized as or somebody else. So what this story doesn't speak so much about what made him go wrong as much as that he made a, at a certain point he made a, a decision to live, a conscious decision, I'm going to live differently than I did before. It wasn't just an intellectual change, but it became really an identity change, a behavioral change. Because many people, I mean most of the her- heretical people we read about, Spinoza, whoever in history, they start out with lots of intellectual questions but still living within the Jewish community and following the uh, following the procedures, following the norms of the community, and then at a certain point they make a break with the community. That's external, and that's what that's what it's trying to describe. But we still want to understand what is going on with Acher. So the first story describes that he sees this angel sitting down and recording things, and then the angel comes and punishes him, and in the end the angel is blamed for not uh, standing up. Okay, we, we don't understand what that's talking about. The next story we can understand a little bit better, but it doesn't seem to have anything to do with the first story. Once he was sitting and studying in the plain of Gennesaret, and he saw a man, and this was a young man who was, who was actually, uh, who, who went and ascended the top of a date palm. Okay, he went to the top of the Tamar, like you were talking about before, Eli. And he took the mother with the young and descended safely. So in other words, he didn't keep the mitzvah of... Shiloh HaKen, he didn't keep it. He took the mother and the baby. What does it say about the mitzvah of Shiloh HaKen? What does it say? You're going to live a long life. So what should happen to that guy who took it? He should fall down and die right there. But it didn't happen. But then, after Shabbat, he saw another man who went to the top of the tree. to fulfill. His father asked him to go get the eggs or get the young from the top of the tree. Shabbat also. After Shabbat. No, the first one. It doesn't say. Oh, I guess so. It doesn't say that, but it could be. Yeah. It could be. It could be. Unlikely. Unlikely that he was outside learning. Because, uh, but who knows? Because in a plane. Because how would he carry? Uh, st- I don't know. Anyway, I don't want to uh, speculate about that. But you could be right. It could just mean um, another week. But it, you know, the translations here are not so perfect. Anyway, he saw another guy go up to the top of the tree. His father asked him to go up to the top of the tree. He took the young and let the mother go. So he fulfilled the mitzvah. 
two mitzvot. Both of these mitzvot, it says about them, long life. Kibura ve'em, you're going to have a long life. Sending away the mother bird, you're going to have a long life. And what happened? He came down from the thing and he was stung by some kind of creature. Doesn't necessarily have to be a snake, whatever it is. And he died. How could that be? It's a, he sees one guy violating the, the uh, mitzvah. And he, he doesn't get punished. He walks away very happy. Like people ask today, right? I see lots of uh, corrupt people, uh, immoral people, and they seem to be having a fine time in life. And then I see people who are very religious. They follow, follow all the mitzvot. They're, they're very uh, committed. And look, they suffer all the time. Why, why does that happen? So that's exactly what's bothering him here, right? So it, where, so he said, wait a second. It's written that you, you, know, you should let the dam go. I guess dam must mean a word for uh, the mother. Uh, but the young you should take it for yourself, that it may be well with thee, and thou, thou mayest prolong thy days. As you can see, I did not write this translation. Where is the goodness and where is the length of days for this man? But he, right? So that's, so that's a very good question. It's a question that many people ask. How could it be that they say no good deed goes unpunished, right? That's a saying in English, right? People do good things and bad things happen to them. This is for... Says, Laman for a rabbi of his caliber... Some of the problems. The first, the first issue, you know, seeing whatever the metatron, whatever right. the metaphysical thing was. Okay, that you know, whatever. That sounds like a deeper kind of thing. That sounds like a deeper. This concept. seems more simplistic. Right, but this one is something that uh, everyone should be always learning. Even some of the basics that Moshe Rabbeinu asked this question. Right, he wasn't able to. He wasn't able to answer. Right, right. So my question, my question is, right? There's an, in all religion. All religion, but, but, uh, you know, yeah. This simple, basic, you know, by, by the time he got to he exactly, was, he should have already had answered had an answer to, to such a simple thing. So, th- so, so, one. right. Okay. So, question number one is, why did this bother him so much? Why did this bother him so much? Number two, how does this jive with what it said the reason was before? In other words, it keeps giving us different reasons why, why Elisha ben Avuya became a heretic. First it said it was because he saw some angel sitting, standing, whatever. Now it says because he saw this guy die after doing a mitzvah that you're supposed to get a long life. And he saw the guy live who didn't do the mitzvah. So, and then he says, and he didn't know. He was unaware that Rabbi Akiva had already explained this. What does it mean? What does it mean it's going to be good for you? In the world which is entirely good. In Olam Abba. And when it says you're going to have a long life, it means in the world of eternity. Ba'olam shekulo aruch, right? That's what the that's what the you know what the mifarshim say. That's what the midrash says. When it says that you that by doing kibbutz you're going to have a long life, by doing shiloh you're going to have a long life. It doesn't mean in this world. It means ba'olam ba. So wait a second. You're telling me that according to this, so if somebody just went over to to Elisha ben Avuya and said, "Excuse me, you know that's not what the pasuk means." You know, Rabbi Akiva explained it. Would say, "Oh, okay, then I won't become a heretic." Like right at that minute, he just decided, "Oh, I see that this person died." I, I'm finished. I, I'm not going to be able to follow the religion anymore. Somebody could have just come over and said, no, 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 wait, before you make that rash decision, let me tell you what Rabbi Akiva said. He said that it's only referring to Olam Abba, not to this world. That's all that, he, he just needed to ask the question? That sounds like a very, very rash decision to make without investigating. Is there any explanation? Right? So that's, that adds to it. In other words, it's similar to your question. In other words, this seems like a very simple problem. But the answer that they're saying that he should have known... It sounds also so simple that, what, he didn't know one Midrash? He didn't know the Midrash of Rabbi Akiva, so that's why he became a heretic? He didn't learn that one interpretation of Rabbi Akiva? So he became a heretic. It's strange. Now, another, another story, uh, which is quoted also in Masachir Chagiga, but it's brought, brought here, right? it says, he saw the tongue of Rabbi Huda in the mouth of a dog, or Chutzpit HaTorgeman, it says in one of them, that he saw Chutzpit's, uh, tongue in the mouth of a dog, and he said, "How could the uh, tongue that studied Torah and, and you know uh, brought forth wisdom of Torah be you know treated like this? How could such uh, horrible things happen like this?" And so, therefore, he said, "You know what? There's no reward for the righteous, and there's no there's no triyata mitim because look, if such a tzaddik could suffer in this way, then it, could, it must be that God doesn't care about people." So again, that seems to fit with the apple with the tree climbing, right? With the sending away. Right? The idea that, what kind of reward is this for a person who is so good? So that seems to fit with the profile. Now let's turn to the next page. Again, this is really actually the same thing again. Number five is really a repeat of, the, of what we saw already. It's just the, it's the shorter version that's brought in Masach Kiddushin. Okay. Now, there's another Midrash in Ruth that says, when his mother was pregnant with him, she passed by Bate Avodah Zarah. 
and when she would smell the good food from the Avodazara place, they gave some of it to her to eat because when a pregnant woman would smell food and then she would have you know problems, you know she would smell something, they have to feed her right away. So she doesn't lose the baby. So she ended up eating some of this Avodazara stuff and the venom went in and it made Achayar the person that he was. Wait, so, but, but according to that, so how did he become such a great Talmud Chacham before? He became such a big Talmud Chacham, great scholar, and now you're just saying he had a genetic defect or something, you know? His mother, it was like, uh, like uh, infant alcohol syndrome, you know, where the, uh, the mother was drinking or the mother was, you know, doing drugs when she was pregnant and now he can't. That's what happened. I mean, accor- that makes it, he's not even morally culpable according to that. How is he responsible for it then? It's his mom's fault. He's blaming it on his mother. It's very interesting. But again, it doesn't... But the Gemara just told us, no, he saw an angel sitting. No, he saw a guy climb up a tree and fall down. No, he saw uh, a tongue being dragged around by a, by a pig or a dog, depending on the version. Okay? So now you're telling me, no, he was born that way. Next story. Okay? So, uh, actually, let's skip this one first and go to number... One second... I want to do the other one first. Where is it? Um, yeah, on the, on the next page, on the next page, the second paragraph. Okay. Alicia replied. Where it says, Alicia replied, Woe to those who are lost and not found. Now, by the way, what he keeps doing, Rebbe Meir, what was famous about Rebbe Meir was that even though Alicia ben became a heretic, Rebbe Meir kept following him around all the time and kept learning from him despite his being heretic. And all the other Chachamim were against this. They said, how can you follow this heretic around learning from him? It's not right. Okay. What? He said, because I can write. He said, because I can take the good and throw away the bad. Anybody else would be influenced by the bad. So he said, okay. So he says, you're te- and he keeps telling him what I, Re- Rebbe Akiva would say. So whatever Rabbi Meir says, as his drasha, he would say, well, that's not what, what Akiva, your teacher, said. So this guy knew the stuff cold. You know, he knew everything that Rabbi Akiva ever said. Which kind of makes us wonder, how could he have not known the drasha of Rabbi Akiva about the Yom Shekulo Aruch? That when it says that you're going to have a long life and it's going to be good for you, it's not talking about in this world. If he knows everything that Rabbi Akiva ever said, better than Rabbi, Meir's, Rabbi Meir knows it. Every time Rabbi Meir gives a drasha, Elisha ben Abuya says, that's not what Akiva said. And notice he calls him by his first name. Why? Because they were colleagues. They were friends. They weren't. Uh, they, they, he, he wasn't. He was on the same level as Rabbi Akiva, pretty much. So he would say to Rabbi Meir, "Your teacher Akiva." He would say, "Your teacher Akiva is, uh, didn't say this." So Rabbi Akiva and Rishon were both teachers of Rabbi Meir. Yeah. So he said. <laughs> so he says they were talking about the pasuk that uh, that that at the end of a thing is better than its beginning. Okay, davar me At the end of something is better than its beginning. So Rabbi Meir gave his own drasha, and the drashot that Rabbi Meir gives to Elisha ben Avuya are always trying to inspire him to do teshuva. Right? So he said it's like a person who learned Torah in his youth and forgot it, but in his old age he comes back. Right? Elisha ben Avuya says, no, 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 that's not what it means. You don't know what Akiva, your own teacher, says. What does he say it means? It means the end of a matter is better than its beginning when it is good from the beginning. When it's good from the beginning. And mine is a case in point. How so? He says, this, is, this, this I believe is from the Yerushalmi. This is from the Yerushalmi. So he says, he says, Avuya, my father, was among the great men of Yerushalayim. When the day of my circumcision arrived, he, he, he invited all the great men of Yerushalayim and set them in one house. And Rabbi Elazar and Rabbi Yoshua, and Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yoshua were in another house. Okay? Another room, it means. It doesn't mean another house. It means another room. Now, this is quoted by Tosafot in Masech and Chagigah on the side. It's, in, it's actually in Yerushalayim. While the guests were eating, drinking, singing, clapping, and dancing, Rabbi Eliezer said to Rabbi Yoshua, while well, they do their thing, let's do ours. In other words, they were just having a party in the next room for the Brit Milah, and uh, the rabbi said, let's do our thing, meaning let's learn some Torah while we're, while we're uh, not doing anything else. They sat down and learned Torah. From Torah they did Nevi'im, Nevi'im they did Kituvim. Look what they're learning. These great rabbis didn't learn Gemara, they were learning Tanakh. Right? But that's a besides point. So a fire descended from heaven and enveloped them. So if I'm always, I always bring up my pet peeve. So the fire surrounds them. There's a ring of fire surrounds these rabbis as they're learning Tanakh, not Talmud. And, uh, and Avuya, who's the father, comes in and says, My masters, did you come here to burn my house down on me? What is going on here? You're starting a fire in my house. They said to him, Chas v'shalom. We were sitting and reviewing words of Torah, and Torah to Nevi'im, Nevi'im to Kituvim, and the words were as joyous as, when, as at Har Sinai. And you know that at Har Sinai, there was lots of fire, so the fire is surrounding us. So what happens? 
So Avuya said, he's, now this is Elisha ben Avuya talking, my father Avuya said to them, my masters, if this is the power of Torah, and my son survives, because you know there was a high rate of infant mortality back then, then I will dedicate him to Torah. So how did it turn out that Elisha ben Avuya became such a great Talmud Chacham? Because his father saw the power of Torah. The power of it, right? Since his intentions were not for the sake of heaven, his desire was not fulfilled in, the same, in that same man. In other words, meaning to say that his, the original intentions, uh, the translation is terrible, but what it means to say is that his intention was, I want my son to, it's like if somebody told you, what, it's like once I heard, I, I don't want to, I'm not going to say any names, but once I heard a Mikubal, who's a very well-known Mikubal speak, and he talk, talked about how, what inspired him to become a Mikubal, was that he came to the house of another Mikubal, who's also very famous, and I won't mention their name, and he saw all the magical things that they could do. And he said when he saw the magic they could do, he said, Psh, I want to become a Mikubal now. I'm going to study and become a Mikubal. Right? What? I want to be a magician too. Right, I want, to, I want to have the powers. Right, so that's exactly what happened here. Pretty much. I mean, I didn't tell him that at the time. I didn't say, you know, you kind of remind me of a great Talmud Chacham. <laughs> I'm not going to say any names, but it was one of the great Mikubalim of the previous generation. And I heard it from a Mikubal who's alive now. Um, in any case, he, uh, he, but that, that's exactly what happened in this story. That he, they saw the power of Torah. Now, this ring of fire or whatever it is, we don't know exactly whether it's describing something. You know, it, my sense of it would be that it's describing something, not necessarily that happened in a physical sense, but something about the power, the charisma. Okay, something about the energy. He could see what kind of a presence that they had, that it was like fire surrounded them. In other words, like when it talks about how when Rabban Yochanan ben Zakai would learn if a, if a bird flew over his head, it would be burnt up by the fire. It's not saying literally that he had, you know, like Iron Dome, you know, shooting out of his head. It means that he, it means that the power of the, the, the energy of that Torah was so great, it was as if, you know, it would burn up, it would burn things up, the way that we would say that today. Somebody's burnt, someone's on fire. That guy's on fire. We would say, you know, that guy's on fire right now. We don't call the fire department when we say he's on fire. What we mean is, you see the energy, the power of the Torah, you know, animating the guy. So he saw there was something powerful about these Chachamim. He wanted it for his son. So that, I think, you know, in a... And, and you know, there's an end to the story, but let, let's just go a little bit further. So Elisha then says to him, what else did you expound? And Rabbi Meir says, gold and crystal cannot be compared to the wisdom of Hashem. Okay. And he said, how did you begin? Rabbi Meir said, words of Torah are as difficult to acquire as vessels of gold. And as easy to lose as crystal. Just as vessels of gold and vessels of crystal can be made whole again after they're broken, a Torah scholar who forgot what he learned can go back and learn it as in the beginning. Notice Rabbi Meir is, uh, he's, uh, he's being, trying to be mikarev all the time, you know. Don't feel like you can't come back, you can come back. And so what is, Elisha says, enough Meir. This is the Shabbat limit. This is the Tchum Shabbat. It was Shabbat. And incidentally, I didn't read the beginning of the story that, you know, he right, horse. he's riding on a horse next to Rebbe Meir on Shabbat. It would be like if he was driving in his car, you know, and Rebbe Meir's walking along the side, you know, and they're talking in the Brei Torah. Not exactly the same. It's not a deal right but still. Right? They come to the Tchum Shabbat. He says, you have to stop here. Tchum Shabbat. So Rebbe Meir says, how do you know? Elisha says, from the steps of my horse, I counted 2,000 amot. What he was talking to him. <laughs> he's talking to him. So you see, this person is uh, not a regular person. Okay? So Meir said to him, all this chokhmah is in you and you don't do tshuva. If you're able to do that, how can you not do tshuva? Elisha said to him, I can't. Meir said, why? Elisha said to him, one time I was riding my horse by the Kodesh HaKodeshim on Yom Kippur. <laughs> What's, right, which is also Shabbat. <laughs> which fell upon Shabbat. And I heard a heavenly voice came out of the Kodesh HaKodeshim and it said, Return children except for Lisha ben Avuya, who knew my power and rebelled against me. What does it mean by his riding his horse? Okay. It means he was riding his horse. That's I mean, literal over that? I mean, he really was riding his horse alongside Rabbi Meir. Um, and you know, in other words, he wasn't observant. The, he wasn't observant anymore. Uh, Alisha Ben Avuya. He, was, but he was a great yeah. genius and something chacham. And uh, you know, he's like some of these really, you know, very learned gedolim from Europe and things like that that they came to America and they, you know, assimilated many times lifestyle-wise, where they became conservative rabbis or they became whatever. But they were you talk to them and learning, and they could run circles around anybody today. So. 
something he, he, which I knew I would never understand. Right. So it's very hard to understand. So he's he said, well, you know, the story. Let me tell you a background story. You know, last Yom Kippur I was also riding my horse. <laughs> I was also Shabbat. And you know, now it's interesting because Shabbat and Yom Kippur are are um, mentioned for a reason because Shabbat is Maseh Bereshit. Right? These are the two areas of esoteric knowledge are represented. Shabbat is Maseh Bereshit. Yom Kippur is Maseh Merkava. It's the absolute transcendence of Hashem. That's what Yom Kippur is about. That's why we don't eat, we don't drink. We don't, we're like Malachim. We're, we're ascending, so to speak, to the purely metaphysical. What of all the Rishuyot, all of the Rishuyot of Kiddushah that we read on Yom Kippur, those long Rishuyot that are written by uh, Rabbi Yehuda Levi mostly, right? You know what I'm talking about? All about all the Malachim, all of the different groups of Malachim and all of their different stations and all that. Why are we reading about all that? Because Yom Kippur is actually the day of Maseh Merkava. It's actually the day that we're focusing the most on the metaphysical realm. We don't understand it. We don't comprehend it. But it's part of the theme of Yom Kippur is to recognize how transcendent and distant from our understanding Hashem really is. That's part of the theme. We're not going to go into Yom Kippur right now. But the idea that he's mentioning Yom Kippur and Shabbat is because those were the areas that he was investigating. You know, Maseh Bereshit, Maseh Merkava. And those are the areas where he sealed his fate. Now we need to understand what is it that where did he go wrong? Why did he go wrong? Why can't he do Teshuvah? Why can't he turn back around? What's the problem here? If he really understands this so well, why can't he do Teshuvah? So apparently what we can conclude from Elisha ben Avuyan, we're just going to get into exactly what his problem was. What we can conclude is that a person can get to a point in their development where if they go too far in certain ways, they can't turn back. He didn't think he could turn back, at least. Now, is it possible that in, in Hashem's eyes, could he have? Yes. But in the mind of Elisha ben Avuya, does, Hashem doesn't close the door on anybody. He, doesn't clo- he didn't close the door on Menashe, the king of Israel, who for 50 years murdered you know, thousands and thousands of people and, and destroyed all the Judaism in the kingdom of Yehudah and replaced it with idolatry. He accepted his teshuvah. He would have accepted Elisha ben Avuya's teshuvah. There's no question. But what's the problem? Elisha ben Avuya was locked into certain ideological uh, viewpoints that he could not extricate himself from. And this is why it's so dangerous to go into speculation about things we're not prepared to handle. Because we can rush into conclusions that we lock in and we're not able to see around them anymore. That's the danger. What? What is the story of Menashe? the king was a, was a really bad melech of uh, Yehuda. Uh, he did the Shuvah in the end, then he was forgiven. Yeah. So, I mean, anybody could be forgiven, but in the, the point that he's hearing a voice telling him that he can't be forgiven is n- his own mind. It's not that Hashem is really saying that. It means that in his mind, there's no, there's no approach for him to go back. He, you know, he's gone too far in his thinking. His thinking has solidified around certain ideas, and he doesn't see a way out. He's trapped himself. He's locked himself. Now, what is it that locked him? And what is the problem? And what is the Gemara trying to say here with all of these different examples? So, what, what I would like to suggest is that, you know, you, you sort of like hinted to it. You, you, you were pointing to it before. That the fact that his father, you know, that we see that his father's motive in uh, wanting him to have religious training or wanting him to become a Talmud Chacham had to do with the material power Right? had to do with that energy, that power, that influence over the world that he perceived as being associated with being a Talmud Chacham. And so what that meant was, and this is true for many people, not just for Elisha ben Avuya, not just for his father, there is a sense that being religious or being a Talmud Chacham is going to give me certain benefits in this world. I expect certain benefits. I expect God to give me a break. I expect God to help me out. I might not come and say, the reason why I'm being religious and learning is because I want this, because that sounds crass and that sounds, you know, very beneath me. But deep down inside, many religious people have a feeling, listen, I'm doing what God expects of me. I'm doing my part. I expect God to do his part. And so what's bothering Elisha ben Avuya is, why don't I see that working out? In other words, I labored under the assumption that there is a correspondence. There's going to be a correspondence between my religion, a person's religious level, a person's chokhmah, and the outcomes that they experience in the material world. Why didn't he understand what Rabbi Akiva said, that it's talking about Yom Shekulo Aruch. It's talking about Olam Haba. All of those rewards are in Olam Haba. Well, well, why didn't, it wasn't because he just didn't hear that from Rabbi Akiva. 
And he knew everything that Rabbi Akiva said. So it wasn't that he just didn't happen to hear that from Rabbi Akiva. The reason is because he couldn't accept that. Because he was attached to the idea that there was physical reward for the mitzvot. That was deep. That was the basis. He said, how could it be that Hashem would run the world in such a way that there's no correspondence between the spiritual direction of a person and their level and the material outcomes and benefits or lack of benefit or suffering or reward that they experience in this world? How could it be? I can't accept that. That means there are two things operating in the world then. And that's what it's ta- that's the Metatron Midrash. In other words, that that according to so Alicia Ben Avuya said there must be it's not that he ever believed that there wasn't a God he never came to the conclusion there was no God he came to the conclusion that there's no correspondence between God or there's no connection between God and what goes on in this physical world in a way he was like a dualist actually Sadia Gaon and some of the Gaonim say that Alicia Ben Avuya he was like a Zoroastrian in the end, he was similar to Zoroastrianism, that he believed in two forces. He believed there was a God, but he believed that in this world there's a manifestation of other forces. Because how else could you explain? If there's one God controlling everything, then how can Chutzpita Metorgaman, how can his tongue be dragged by a pig in the middle of the street? Or by a dog, or whatever it was. In the middle of the, how could it be that a person, if, the, if God is the only master of the universe, then how could a person who climbs up a tree and fulfills the two mitzvot that he's supposed to have a long life, not see results in this world? Okay? So there must be two different uh, things operating. There must be some spiritual realm, and there's some physical realm. There's no correspondence between the two, and therefore religion doesn't make any sense, because religion is what we do in this world. Religion is about this realm, and spirituality is about the other realm. And apparently the two do not work in tandem with one another. There are two different systems operating. And that was really what Elisha ben could not reconcile in his mind. In other words, when he got to the point where he was trying to explain how could it, but what the Gemara is trying to show you is that he had a right what, what the Gemara is trying to show you is that we can all ask this question you know why is it if Hashem is really running the world why should such terrible things happen we can ask the question but Elijah ben Avuya had from the beginning certain assumptions about how it should work how it should work and that's the problem in other words the problem with going into esoteric chokhmah the problem with going into esoteric areas of knowledge is that with or without realizing it we have many assumptions about how God should run the world or how it should operate if God really exists then it should be X or it should be Y God should do this or he shouldn't do that and because we operate with certain assumptions when we're confronted with painful truths that don't correspond to those assumptions we don't know what to do with them so we might go crazy or we might die. we might give up and die. We might go crazy because we can't reconcile these two things. Or we might say, you know what, I don't want anything to do with the whole system. And that's what happened to Elisha Ben Avuya. He said, you know what, there is no reconciliation. I, I'm not going to even try. Ben Zoma tried to reconcile things that couldn't be fit together. So he becomes confused or uh, uh, he, he loses his mind. Elisha Ben Avuya says, I'm not going to lose my mind. I'm going to take the Pashut conclusion. There's no co- correspondence between what goes on in this world and God. And therefore, there's no value to religion in this world because religion it presupposes that there's some connection between what I'm doing in this world and, uh, and the metaphysical, and there isn't any such connection. And that's why it describes him going with the prostitute in the Midrash. In other words, he, he goes to them for, for the physical enjoyments. He says, you know what? As a physical being, I'm just going to go with the pleasures. And that's why it says on Shabbat, why does he pluck the uh, radish? Why specifically does he show that he's not uh, Elisha ben Avuya by violating Shabbat? Because Shabbat is the creation of the physical world as a monument, a testimony to the Creator. As, as the design of the Creator. He's saying, I don't recognize that. The material world is just material. It's just chaos, basically, as far as I'm concerned. God exists in some abstract way, but this world doesn't reflect his design at all. It reflects other forces. And that's why it says he believed in another force, Metatron, or whatever it was. Now, whatever you might say that that means, but the idea of Elisha ben Avuya is he couldn't reconcile the material realities with the spiritual ideas. So as much as he loved learning Torah, as much as he was a huge genius of Torah, and Rebbe Meir couldn't get enough of learning with him, still... 
he was not able to reconcile these opposing forces in the world, what seemed to him to be irreconcilable contradictions between what he expected from the metaphysical and what he saw in the material world. He expected the material world to be a faithful re- reflection of the metaphysical ideals that he taught and to, and to reinforce them and for reward to be clearly given to those who are following the truth and for punishment to clearly be given to those who aren't following the truth. So you see an integrated system of the physical and the spiritual. He didn't see that. He said, okay, there's no integration then. I'm out. Count me out then. I can't return because I'm never going to be able to see it the way I once did. So he loses I can't. And now, oh, so this, let's just, I know we're running late, but let's just at least finish the story so we can see what happens at the end. Years later, Elisha fell ill. They came and said to Rabbi Meir, your teacher's ill. He went to visit him and found him ill. Rabbi Meir said, will you not do it to Shuvan now? You're on your deathbed. Come on. Realize you made a mistake. Realize you went off. If I repent, will it be accepted? He asked. Rabbi Meir says, does not scripture state you turn men back to dust? Right? Adaka. Right? You crush people and at the point of crushing, they can still do Teshuvah. Until the destruction of the soul, they are accepted. At that moment, Elisha wept, passed on and died. Rabbi Meir was happy in his heart and said, it seems my teacher died in repentance. Because he was crying when he died. When he buried him, a fire came down from heaven and burnt his grave continuously. Oi, vey. They came and said to Rabbi Meir, your teacher's grave is burning. He went out wishing to visit the grave and found it burning. What did he do? He removed his cloak and spread it over the grave. By the way, there's some Sephardim that have that custom of putting cloak over the grave when they go. What? Yeah. What? yeah. He said, rest this evening. I'll tell you in a minute. Rest this evening. Then in the morning, if he will redeem you, good. Let him redeem you. But if he does not redeem you, I will redeem you by God. So, okay. That's, a, that's, the, that's quoting from what Boaz said to Ruth. Okay? He said the... Pas- what? So There's some Sfaradim that they, like North Africans, that they, when they go to visit the grave, they put a jacket or a coat over the grave. I don't know why. Anyway, he says, in this world, this is like, okay. So the point is, after he went there and he said this psukim about redeeming and Hashem is good to all of his creations, the fire was extinguished. And of course, the conclusion that he said was that because of the Torah uh, that he had, um, he was accepted back into Olam Haba. And so the, the Gemara goes on. I didn't quote all of the Midrashim because it would have been many sheets, but basically the Gemara goes on to say that, you know, in heaven they were saying, what should, you know, how can we deal with Elisha ben Avuyan? Essentially they said, well, from the perspective of Torah, how can we not honor his Torah? So that's why, they, that's why Hashem didn't want to give him, let's say, have fire burning on his grave or have anything negative against him because of his Torah. We honor his Torah, but on the other hand, his Ma'asim weren't good. What is Ma'asim? Ma'asim is the integration of that knowledge of the transcendence with the physical. And what was Elisha ben Abuya's whole problem? He didn't see any correspondence between the physical world or your actions in this world and the ideals. There's no connection between the two systems. Ideas are very nice. Ideals are very nice. Utopian, transcendent ideas that we can talk about all kinds of philosophies. But when it comes to what they call tachlis, right? Bottom line, there's no result over here. That was the problem. And that's why, that's why the Gemara gives many stories about Elisha ben Abuya. And it says, his Torah was honored. Rabbi Meir wanted his Torah. And he kept trying to tell him, live by the Torah. Don't abandon it. The Torah life, it's not because you get the material war, reward. It's because it's good in its own sake to live according to the Torah, even if you don't see the material benefits in this world. But, but Elisha ben Abuya couldn't see it that way. He, could all, he couldn't make sense out of a world in which there was a conflict between the ideals taught by Hashem and the material world run by Hashem. He had to conclude that the material world is not run by Hashem. Or at least it doesn't correspond to the ideals of the Torah. And therefore he went off. So that's why the, the Gemara says that in, in Shamayim, basically for his Torah he was honored, just like Rabbi Meir honored him. And the Chachamim said, listen, we have to honor his Torah. We have to honor him as a Talmud Chacham in terms of his knowledge. But in terms of his actions... We, we have to show that we, we reject his way of life. His way of life was not in line with the ideas that he taught. And that's, and that's exactly the point. You have many intellectuals. It could be great intellectuals, great philosophers. They speak about big ideas. In their personal life, zero. There's no connection between the personal life and the ideas that they preach. And that was what he became because he said the ideas are beautiful. The ideas are wonderful. Halivai, that the world was as beautiful as these ideas that I'm telling you, and that the world actually corresponded to and reinforced these ideas. But instead, living by these ideas, it gives you bupkis. That's what he said. That's what, that's, that's what he said. I, I live by these beautiful ideas, but, it, but it's an ugly world. And, that, and he couldn't reconcile the two, and that's why he failed. And so the lesson for us is to be very cautious 
when we try to understand these difficult ideas, not to get ahead of ourselves and to realize and have the humility to recognize there are certain questions that we don't have a simple answer to. The simple answer to what, he's, what his problem is, we don't live by the Torah in order to get material reward. We live by it in, because it's good in its own, for its own sake. Because it's the best way of life for its own sake. That's the real answer. But to really internalize that answer, we can give lip service to that answer, but at the end of the day, it's hard to actually have that answer in your heart when life is difficult, life is painful, and you're trying desperately to live by your ideals, and, uh, and, and you're struggling. So, and that's what happened in his mind. He wasn't able to reconcile. But it's a beautiful way of looking at a great person, a great mind, who was faced by you know a, a difficult problem that even today people still grapple with. So let me-